It was like the beginning of second grade. We had just moved here from Colorado and it was a really stressful move and he doesn't like change. It's one of his little quirks. He doesn't like things to change. And so it was really hard to move away from Colorado and be somewhere new. And I think that was one of the triggers maybe. But anyway, after we'd been in this house for about four, four months, he started saying things like, Mom, I'm sad, and I don't know why. And I was baffled, and I just kind of said, Well, it was the move, the changes, this is hard for him, you know, we'll get through it. At one point, I went to his doctor, and I said, Well, I think he might be depressed. Something's wrong, he's feeling sad. And this doctor, well, she's really good with physical ailments, but... I, I grew to hate her. <laughs> she, she looked at him and she said in an all-knowing way, well, I've seen depressed kids and he's not depressed. You know, as if to say to me, um, you're an hysterical mother. Just calm down, lady, and, you know, everything's going to be okay. I heard that same line over and over again, but that was the first time. So anyway, I, I took her advice and we let it go. And, and then one day... Um, he played basketball. It was this little kid basketball thing, and, and they were having this big tournament, and we were in the high school gym, and there's all the other little second and third grade basketball players, and they're bouncing balls, and the parents are on the bleachers, and it's really fun. And, and all of a sudden, he's out there, and he just starts crying. He's just standing there, and there's balls going all around him and kids running, and he's just standing there crying. And I ran down from the bleachers, and I, you know tried to pull him off the court and talk with him and he wouldn't leave the court. He just stood there crying. And I said, what's the matter? What do you need? And I don't know. And he just cried and cried. And finally we went to the car and I, you know, I held him and he cried and we came home and he was just so upset and, and, and it took him a while to be able to talk about it. But that night is, as I was running a bath and he was getting into the bath and he said, mom, I, I know why I'm crying. And he said, it's because I'm fat. <laughs> you know, I just, <laughs> what do you say? It's like, he's, he's extremely thin. It runs in both, sides of the family and and we never even thought about it we don't talk about it it's uh you know he's i i'm a vegetarian i'm into health food i always have been you know he didn't have sugar until he was two i raised him on brown rice and mashed squash and 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 <laughs> plain yogurt and he used to eat tofu raw it's just all of a sudden what you know, you think you're fat. Well, I, I gave him a big hug and and I knew that I shouldn't say, well, you're not fat, that's silly. I just, I just tried to tell him, well, I don't feel that way. I don't see you as fat and I'm sorry you feel that way. And boy, just all of the sudden, all of a sudden this, this huge thing opened up and, and our life was never the same after that day. It was just never the same. And there were days when I would sit right here with him on my lap, you know, this second grader, and he would be hysterical. He would be thrashing around and screaming, and he would be saying, I hate myself. I hate myself. I want to die. Just kill me. And he'd be screaming in my ear, just kill me, just kill me. And I would just hold him tight. I would just hold him. You know, and, and finally, after after a couple of weeks of this, almost every day, I realized that I could put something diverting on the TV. And I started renting cartoons and things. And if I'd put in a new one each time and, and he would just slowly wind down and his attention would go to the TV show. And then, you know, pretty soon he'd be quiet and calm and it would be over for that, for that, for now, you know? And I'm a 
thoughtful person, you know, and, and I thought this through a lot. And, and I realized that, um, so there was something happening that I didn't understand. I had to respect it and I had to respect him and I had to take care of it. And it, it was just like, this is my job. And I started going around to different professionals and asking, you know, what do I do? I just assumed that it was a psychological problem. So I went, this is a small town, but I went to two different uh, counselors and then... Um, I went to several MDs. I went to several psychologists. And they, they would all, I mean, it was all the same. I mean, I can't even remember all of them. It's just that they were all the same. They would, I've, I've got reports that they wrote up. And they're all, they're all the same. They say, well, he and his mom are too enmeshed. They're, you know, she's too involved with him. She does too much for him. They're too close and I remember this one. She was arrogant. She was horrible. And she's saying, you look like you're depressed. Are you depressed? Well, hell yes, I'm depressed. You know, my, my son wants to die and he's getting thin and he's cold all the time and he refuses to wear warm clothes and he, he throws food at the walls and, and he kicks holes. I've got a holes in my doors and in my walls. Yeah, I'm depressed. Yeah, you're right. But she's looking at me as like, well, you have caused this in your child through your depression. And I hated her. I just, uh, I was shaking. I just hated her. I, I refused to have anything more to do with her. pamphlet somebody got gotten for me given me so one of the one of the psychiatrists I'd gone to visit given me this pamphlet it's like this uh, brochure of different clinics you can take your child to these pretty color pictures some of them are horse ranches and they show the kids you know working with clay and and I flipped through that and I started reading their blurbs well they were all for teenage girls most of them didn't take boys and only a couple of them. Well, I think I can think of one of them in Denver that would take young boys. So they're all about young girls and having a good time. And they looked very expensive, very expensive. And they, it just, it just wasn't right. Well, you know, I got on the internet and I started reading more and calling some of these places and finding out that they don't take little boys. Because little boys don't get eating disorders. You know, everybody knows that. And I got on the website, the Cartini website, and I watched that video. And, you know, it's like, you know, the heavens opened up and the angels were saying, it was like that. It was like that. I said, well, they're talking about families here. How refreshing. <laughs> they're... You know, this could be just a trap, but I don't think so. You know, I don't think so. I think they're seriously going to, you know, make use of the family structure instead of pushing us away from our children. You know, everybody wants to say it's the family's fault and isolate the child from the family, cure the child, and then reintegrate it into the family. But they, were, they weren't saying this at Cartini. And I watched that video a couple of times, and I got excited. I was hopeful for the first time. That's what it was, you know, and it's very exciting to have hope after three and a half, almost four years since he'd started out, you know, and that had been my life, finding a way to get him to eat. We st I still find places where there's dried food on the wall. <laughs> We went into um, Emmanuel Hospital, which seems like the finest hospital I've ever seen. I got to stay in the room with him. He was in the hospital for six days. I stayed in there with him. I slept in the window seat. 
When things got stressful for him, I read to him, and that calmed him down. At first, he wanted to kill all the doctors. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he started eating after, well, on the second day, he started eating, and he never stopped. We went into the Ronald McDonald house, and I would stay in there during the day, and, you know, was it four days a week, I think, that he spent in the in the day treatment. And it was just, it was just nice. It was nice. It was like walking him to school in the morning and then coming home and waiting for him to come back because he was in good hands. And I had toured the facility and I liked it. There were kids just hanging out, you know, nobody was stressing them. Of course, nobody was stressing them. They were already stressing themselves. It was just a, a relaxed place and with caring people. And I think that's all you need. And like the doctors say, the, the medicine is the food. That's all you need is, the, is just to get them eating again. And once a kid starts eating, it, it, the momentum starts going, I think. I know some kids have relapses. At, at the children's hospital in Seattle, they told us to expect to come back to the hospital several times, that that's what happened. It was part of the treatment. You got released from the hospital. You'd go home. A few months later, you'd come back and redo it. It just never seemed like that would happen here. Um, he he would come back to, at, at the end of the day, he'd come back and complain that it was boring. There was nothing to do. He hated it. He hated it. Those people were so awful. Well, of course, I, I knew that he was resisting the treatment. And so it was okay. You know, I just comforted him and we went on with it. I remember for a while I rented a wheelchair because he wasn't supposed to get any activity. And uh, I rented a wheelchair and we, I wheeled him around Portland. We got on buses and went to parks and I wheeled him around parks. And there was just fond memories because at the time I knew he was healing. And so that's a happy place for me is to remember those times as, as healing and, and getting better and, and having hope and believing that this was going the right direction. Nobody tried to force anything. They just laid down consequences. If you don't eat, you get the tube. You go back to the hospital. This happens. You have to stay longer. And it was made very clear. There were no secrets from me, from him, anything. It was just very open. You know, you eat or else this will happen. Nobody cried about it. They just said this will happen. And, and that takes a lot of stress off for kids, I think. You know, when you make it emotional, when you say, if you don't eat, I'm going to, you know, take this away, then it becomes very stressful. Well, it's not stressful because they knew what to expect. Um, it meant a lot to me that, that this day treatment, you know, he came home to me at the end of the day, that we slept in the same room together, we talked about stuff. I never got the feeling that my son was out of my realm of protection. I wasn't handing him over to anybody. It's just like he was going off to kindergarten and coming back again, only we were growing towards a healthy place. Um, on the days that he didn't go, I cooked for him. So we were growing together. You know, nobody was fixing him for me and then returning him to me. We were going through this together, and it was like it's like a slow incline, just both of us marching slowly up this hill. And there were never any doubts that this wasn't going to work. It was just a matter of going through the motions. And we were in the day treatment for th three to four weeks. Um, because we lived far away from Portland, we only came back a couple of weekends, I think. I liked the family therapy. I had a real good connection with the therapist. My son wouldn't talk to her, but, you know, we talked around him. <laughs> and um, she helped me a lot in lots of different ways. You know, you can't really divide a person up and say, well, this is the illness due to the eating uh, disorder, and this is the illness due to, you know, something else and this is I mean a person is an integrated whole and by treating one part you're reaching the other part and by me dealing with my anxieties with the family therapist it came back on my son because he had a more relaxed happy mom and we were just doing it together um one day the parents always get a, a day to go in 
to the you know to eat lunch with the kids in the day treatment. And it was fun because I got to see the other kids, some characters, some neat kids, really neat kids, and it just it just struck me that these are all very likable kids, and I don't see any of them who are just doing this for attention. They're just very sincere kids, and they're just going through their lives. How could anybody say otherwise? You know, they were all very good kids. They were all bright kids. And and I could see a lot of the similarity. You know, kids from very wildly different backgrounds, and yet I could see similarities between my son and these kids. I mean, it has to be something in the brain that triggers that. Because they come from different backgrounds and different families. say he's cured of eating disorder. I don't think that happens. I'd say we're living with it. We're living very well with it. I mean, I still uh, measure his food. I still write it down what he eats. And he sees me do these things and he still resists it. But it's more like habit now than, than real threat. You know, he's okay with that. Now that we're a couple years, it's been almost two years we're, we're down the road from the treatment. He he doesn't fight about food. He still watches me measure. He still says, well, you're giving me too much of this. But he backs down when I say, no, you just eat it. I mean, it's part of our eating routine now. It's It seems to me that Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving comes around and he starts to stress. And then by Christmas, it's He's stressed out, and it's not its not even just the fact that most families get together and eat a lot. It's not exactly even that. It's just, I think it's more the general tension of excitement of Christmas and that sort of thing. Whatever excites him or makes him a little bit tense seems to sort of kick off a little bit of the eating disorder behaviors that we used to have. It's not so severe, but there are certain things... The stressfulness of, of knowing this thing is happening that's different and it triggers off these behaviors and subsequently that can affect his eating disorder. So when it, anytime something is stressing him out, I see the be, old behaviors kind of inch back and then there might be some stress about eating. But if if I handle it right, if he's doing right, I mean, if we just sort of flow with it, it eases down and, and we're back to our, you know, zero level again. Mostly, mostly it's pretty good. And I noticed over the last two years that we have less and less periods where things go wrong. He doesn't flare up like he used to. He used to get very angry. And I know that, that part of that was just hunger, you know. Um, he's doing really well. He's do I, in fact, I, I don't think about it all the time anymore. <laughs> I can forget about it, you know? But I'll tell you, the hardest part was coming home after treatment, in a way. I mean, it's like, it's like I was on a, on a crusade, on a mission, and I was finding strength I didn't know I had. But but after after we finished with the day treatment and we finally came home, it was like he and I changed together. And then we came back to a place that was the same. It was like post-traumatic stress. And I really feel it still. I really do. I'm still on medication. I've tried a couple of times to get off it. And I can't. Horrible things happen in my head. I feel I'm, this must be post-traumatic stress because whew, I go into a deep pit now when I'm not on medication. It's just, it took everything I had, you know, and I knew, I knew it had to be me because nobody else was going to do it. 
I don't know where I found the strength, but I'm still trying to replenish my supply. <laughs> I don't know where it comes from because I think I really overdrew. It, it was scary and it was hard, but it's amazing that love can do that. It can give you whatever you need to get through.